She was a young woman who had a whole life ahead of her. Everybody was jittery, wondering what had happened to her. Really a very dangerous person. This isn't a real whodunit. Crimes don't really happen here. She'd been placed inside a, a suitcase. This was a brutal, horrific murder and an awful way to leave the body of a, of a teenage girl. I've been a criminal lawyer for over 30 years and I've never dealt with a case like this before. To have three trials is very rare, but the case was of such importance. He would have walked free. And given what he had done before, we were in no doubt that he was a dangerous man. Nestled in the southwest corner of Kent, the so-called Garden of England, this is the leafy historic town of Royal Tunbridge Wells. I would describe Tunbridge Wells as a safe family sort of location, uh, wealthy and middle class. <laughs> There's a really low level of crime in the area. I feel very safe walking around at night. People enjoy a very peaceful life on the whole and generally go about their business. Tunbridge Wells is your archetypal Middle England. It's picturesque, it's surrounded by beautiful countryside. Crimes don't really happen here. But that picture postcard image was about to be shattered. Kent police receive a call about a missing person, 17-year-old Terry Edmonds. The day before Easter Monday, Terry had arranged to meet her boyfriend, but she never showed up. This was really out of character. She stayed in contact with her boyfriend regularly. She texted him on the hour almost, and he did the same back to her. They sent multiple texts to each other each day. So the fact that she did not text him was really unusual and set the alarm bells ringing. Terry's boyfriend sent her 20 texts, but she never replied to any of them. Her boyfriend got concerned, tried to phone her, didn't get any response, and then alerted her mum. And her mum then reported her missing to the police. This disappearance was out of the ordinary for the happy-go-lucky teen. She was bright and intelligent. She had eight A-grade GCSEs. She was fiercely independent. She was a teenager who was turning into a young woman. She decided to spread her wings, leaving home at just 16 to live in a housing association hostel in the centre of Tunbridge Wells. She had aspirations to be a nurse. She was waiting to join college. She was too young to start training at that point to be a nurse. But from everything that we've heard, she was a caring, lovely, independent and headstrong, her mother said, but a young woman who had a whole life ahead of her. She was very popular, lots of friends, was a, a girly girl. They described her as always liked to look nice, took care of herself. But those friends were all equally puzzled at her disappearance. The only lead police have. She was five miles away in the town of Tonbridge when she last made contact. She was in touch with her boyfriend and she'd been to Tonbridge for the day. And she said, I'm in Tonbridge Park, I'll be coming back soon. Um, and then she didn't arrive back in Tonbridge Wells. So we started doing some searching in Tonbridge. Because that's where she was last heard of. So police cast their net wide, searching parks, old buildings, rivers, anywhere the missing teen could be. But the trail runs cold. With no other options, police appeal to the public and press for help. Her disappearance makes a big splash across the local media. Tunbridge Wells is a place where, where crime doesn't normally happen. It's a tranquil place. So when a teenage girl goes missing, 
it becomes a news story. And Terry was just 17 years old. She had a mother, she had a boyfriend. So that's a story of, of, of local significance. Terry going missing was really shocking for the people of Tunbridge Wells. And people were extremely worried. Everybody was jittery, wondering where she was and what had happened to her. It's a closed community, people talk. So if there's something that does happen, then word does spread quite quickly. It's 10 days since Terry went missing and still no word from her. The family makes another desperate appeal to the public. As time passed, we get more and more concerned when someone doesn't stay in contact. And what we were, we were really more concerned about with this case was she'd not been in touch with her mum. Her mum would tell us that Terry always would, would respond to her. Even if it was a, I don't want to talk to you, she would get a response. So when that didn't happen, obviously the concerns were raised. Concerns are also rising across her close-knit hometown of Tunbridge Wells. I think as the days went by and Terry was missing, fear started to grow that something terrible had happened to her. And there was a big community effort. There were posters everywhere. The taxi drivers all carried flyers. And there was even an information point by police for two reasons. One, to gather information and other reason to try and reassure people because there was a lot of worry at that time. In the meantime, police have been trawling through hours of CCTV footage close to where she was last seen in the nearby town of Tonbridge. Suddenly, there's a breakthrough. Terry is spotted at Tonbridge railway station on the day of her disappearance. When we checked the CCTV, we actually found that she had actually got on the train to go to Tunbridge Wells. And then checking the CCTV at Tunbridge Wells railway station, we found that she, she had got off the train at Tunbridge Wells. So at that point, the search, she moved from Tunbridge to Tunbridge Wells. The investigation suddenly picks up pace in the hunt to find the missing teen. Police now draw up a search plan using this new CCTV sighting. The last sighting of Terry Edmonds was at Tunbridge Wells Rail Station where she got off the train at 6.23. So she walked across here and Terry was never seen again. Investigators plan a search grid around this last known location. The hunt leads to the supermarket car park opposite the station. On the 12th day of Terry's disappearance, there are reports of frenzied police activity on wasteland next to the car park. This area was absolutely cordoned off. There were police everywhere, police vehicles. So the public had absolutely no entry. They closed the car park off while forensics were working at the scene. So this was an absolute no-go area for the public. The search teams had made a grim discovery. The suitcase was discovered under a vehicle ramp going into the car park. And when the searching officers opened it, they found a young lady's body she was in a fetal position in that suitcase. This young woman appeared to have been mercilessly strangled. She'd been placed inside a, a suitcase that had been well hidden behind a wall, a squalid, desolate and dirty spot to, to leave a young girl's body. This was a brutal, horrific murder. When the suitcase was found with a body inside, I think... It was the news that everyone had been dreading in a way. But I think most of us had that sinking feeling that it was going to be Terry. Police in Tunbridge Wells have been searching for missing teen Terry Edmonds. 
On the 12th day of her disappearance, they make a gruesome discovery under a car park ramp close to the station. The body of a teenage girl is found stuffed into a suitcase. She'd been strangled. This was a brutal, horrific murder, a desperately tragic, an awful way to, to leave the body of a, of a teenage girl. The person who killed her had no sense of humanity to, to leave a teenager in, in such a position. The body in the suitcase was found behind a wall just here. Immediately, police taped off the area and there were lots and lots of police officers, forensic teams, sifting through the area looking for evidence. Police are in no doubt that the body in the dark green suitcase is tragically Terry's. We had to go through formal identification process, but we, we knew from the description that that was Terry in the suitcase. The next day, the body is formally identified as Terry Edmonds. The news rocks the idyllic town of Tunbridge Wells. To hear that she'd been murdered and her body found in such an awful way, stuffed into a suitcase, I think people were absolutely horrified and so sad. Terry's disappearance quickly turned into a murder investigation and that really sent shockwaves through the close-knit community of, of Tunbridge Wells. It scared people primarily because she was a young teenage girl, but also because there are many parents in Tunbridge Wells who feared that there could be a killer on the loose. To quell residents' fears, police presence is stepped up across the town. Investigators hit the streets, carrying out door-to-door -door inquiries for any leads on the killer. Kent Police followed a lot of lines of inquiry. They had 50 police officers working on it. They were talking to quite a few people in relation to her disappearance and death. The post-mortem reveals horrifying injuries to the young teen. The details of the post-mortem were shocking. They were horrific. And as a seasoned journalist, it was upsetting. Terry had endured a really brutal and violent attack. She had been physically overpowered. She'd been raped and she'd suffered a number of injuries. And her last moments would have been truly horrific. The post-mortem examination showed that she had grazes on her back and she'd been strangled. Terry was strangled by a scarf that she was wearing. Where it, she looped it through, and by pulling it tight, he'd, he'd strangled her. She had some facial injuries where she'd taken some strikes to the face as well. And she was probably smothered with a pink sheet, which was found away from the scene. Blood is found on this mysterious pink sheet, which is retrieved with Terry's trainers and her cigarette lighter in a pile of rubbish close to her body. They're sent off for analysis at the lab. But it's the suitcase that police hope could be the key to finding her killer. Once the body had been removed, then the suitcase itself was considered as a crime scene. And that crime scene was essentially packaged up carefully and submitted to the Forensic Science Laboratory for examination. Police hope testing for traces of DNA could provide answers to some of their biggest questions. Initially, we were looking to see where the suitcase had come from. Could we have an owner of the suitcase? Could that be a, a big clue for us? Whilst the lab pours over the suitcase, the spotlight falls on the person who raised the alarm. Terry's boyfriend. New evidence comes to light about a fallout with his girlfriend. The last person that the police were initially aware of that had spoken to Terry was her boyfriend. And they'd had a row. Bearing in mind, most murders are committed by people that are known to the victim. Samples of the boyfriend's DNA are also found on Terry's body. 
police investigating the disappearance of 17-year-old Terry Edmonds have today made an arrest. Detectives arrest Terry's boyfriend at his home in the nearby village of Hadlow. He's taken in for questioning. He was living with his mother in a house in Hadlow and when he was arrested, police went to his property, uniformed officers were stationed outside and forensic officers went into his house and conducted a search all night. But eventually, this would draw a blank. They did release him without charge because it was quite clear he was not involved in any way, shape or form. And it was clear he was at work and, and there was no way that he was involved. With the boyfriend eliminated, police focus on the suitcase. Forensic scientists have been putting their star piece of evidence under the microscope, and the suitcase has yielded a significant lead. We recovered various samples, including a sample of DNA from the retractable handle. And the retractable handle had like a, a little switch on it. So we recovered material from that switch and that DNA profile matched an individual that was of interest to the police investigation. That was a, a light bulb moment in the investigation because we felt that, you know, that, that, that would lead investigatively to the identification of a suspect. So police make a second arrest and the man is brought in for questioning. It's a turning point for the investigation. That suspect in this case turned out to be the previous owner of the suitcase. Now that person then gave information to the police to say, that is my suitcase, but I, I gave that suitcase away. I believe actually it was given to the Salvation Army, so a charity donation. As the police hit another brick wall, the clock's still ticking and there's a brutal murderer on the run. Clearly a dangerous person, clearly a very dangerous person and trying to get them. This is the real who done it. So detectives have to go back to the drawing board, refocusing their efforts on the location where Terry was found. The car park. Through their inquiries, investigators discover it was often part of her regular journey through town. And she used the car park as a short cut through, if you like, to make her way back to the hostel that she was staying at that was just at the rear of the car park. Though nothing on the police's CCTV trawl shows Terry's last suspected steps through it. There was no CCTV in the car park itself, but there was CCTV at the exit and she wasn't seen to leave. So we checked everything, double checked it, triple checked it. We couldn't, we couldn't see her leave. Police can now prove Terry never left the car park, which means she must have been killed there. They double down their efforts to find out who else could have been using it on the Easter Monday evening she went missing. We had to look wider and we were looking at other people. And within the car park in Tunbridge Wells, there were some people that, that we called the rough sleepers. They were homeless people who'd found certain areas of the car park, the stairwells of the car park that they used as accommodation. And on those stairwells, certain people sleeping rough there on cardboard mattresses, sleeping bags, duvets, that kind of thing. We started looking at those people to see if there's anyone there was of interest to us. We made inquiries for the rough sleepers in the car park. Did any of them own a suitcase? And they all denied it. But intelligence from an officer on the beat suggests otherwise. A local police officer told us that he knew of one person who had a suitcase. And we looked through our records and we'd spoken to that person, he denied it. So there was a reason why he denied being the owner of a suitcase. With their suspicions raised, detectives head straight back to the car park. They need to find the rough sleeper whose story doesn't quite stack up. We then went and spoke to him again. He said he did have a suitcase, but someone had stolen it and it was kept in the stairwell. Someone had emptied his clothes out from it and the suitcase had gone. But for investigators, something about his story doesn't seem right. So they arrest him. 
Perhaps this new suspect could blow the case wide open. In Tunbridge Wells, 17-year-old Terry Edmonds has been found dead. She was sexually assaulted and dumped inside a suitcase next to a car park. Police have made another arrest. A local homeless man has been brought in for questioning. 21-year-old Philip Bell. He confirmed that the suitcase that Terry was in was the suitcase that he had previously owned. And we asked him more about it, but he insisted that the suitcase had been stolen. Nevertheless, there were little glitches in his story that were starting to cause the police concern, and that's when they, they started to kind of zone in on him as a suspect. Although police can find no evidence that their victim, Terry Newbell, they realise this isn't the first time he's had a brush with the law. Philip Bell came to Tunbridge Wells from Salisbury and he sort of set up a, a base in Tunbridge Wells. But he had left school at the age of 15 without any qualifications and had started living on the street. He got involved in petty crime. He became a drug dealer. Philip Bell had been in Tunbridge Wells for about two years, living rough, and he was heavily into drugs, so cannabis, crack, speed, solvents. So he was a big drug taker and just drifting around, really. And Bell's transient lifestyle puts him at the location where police believe Terry met her fate. The car park. Through their inquiries, police are told Bell had set up home on the landing of one of the disused stairwells. In the basement of that stairwell, forensic investigators find something sinister with a link to Terry. She had some dirt, some debris on her, inside her clothes, that was directly linked to the bottom of the stairwell. And at the bottom of that stairwell, her blood was found. The fact that her blood, her being in that stairwell and injured was really important because it, it identified the attack site, essentially. So police have found their murder scene. But during questioning, Bell denies he was ever in the stairwell, or even the car park, at the time when Terry disappeared. He told them that he had nothing to do with Terry's murder, and he hadn't even seen her. However, when investigators seize his clothes, something raises their suspicions. Having taken his trousers, they noticed that he had grazing on his knees, and that was consistent with him being astride Terry when he assaulted her and grazing his knees. Now, he said he'd done that playing football. Now, we interviewed all the people that he used to play football with, and none of them ever remembered him actually falling down or hurting his knees whilst playing football in the time frame we were talking about. So, again, that disproved part of what he was saying. Although the case against Bell is beginning to build, the evidence is largely circumstantial. Detectives still don't have enough proof to charge their prime suspect with murder. With there being no other evidence at that particular time, we, we had to release him on bail whilst we carried out other inquiries. It's a blow for the investigation. Just days later, Searching for answers about her daughter's death, Terry's mum once again makes an emotional public appeal. I am begging you, please, if anybody knows anything, however little, get in touch, because anything to help catch the person that's done this will help. Over the next months, detectives work 24-7 in the hope to get the potentially dangerous Philip Bell back behind bars. They doggedly trawled through hours and hours of the town's CCTV footage for anything that could link him to Terry's disappearance. Suddenly, something catches their eye. 
some time later, we were looking at more CCTV and we found Philip Bell. We'd found him walking past the railway station and going into the car park just a few seconds after we suspect Terry had gone in. Although we never saw him and Terry together, it was clear from the timing that he followed her in moments after she went into the car park. Police now have proof that their suspected killer and his victim would have crossed paths. And that's not all. We then, about an hour later, we had CCTV of him leaving the car park. So that sort of brought us to a conclusion that she'd gone in, he'd gone in shortly afterwards, he'd come out, but she hadn't. So that added to our suspicions that he could have been responsible. For the investigation team, this is really big. The new CCTV blows apart Bell's claim that he wasn't at the murder scene at the time of Terry's attack. Initially, when Philip Bell was um, arrested and interviewed in May, he denied that he'd returned to the car park. Although there was no CCTV or eyewitness accounts from what happened within the car park, the CCTV was absolutely crucial because it uh, demonstrated that uh, Terry and Philip Bell were effectively on a collision course as they entered the car park. Detectives also spot something strange about Bell's clothing as he leaves the car park. When we suspect was the hour in which Terry was killed, he came out wearing a different pair of jeans. And we're able to identify that from CCTV because one pair was baggy and one pair was, was slim fitting. So we were asking why, why had he changed that clothing? Soon investigators come up with a sinister theory. Our theory was that he had got blood on his trousers taken and disposed of those trousers and changed them in that hour. Because why else? Why would you suddenly change your trousers halfway through the day? Could this explain Bell's change of clothing? There was only one way to find out. Philip Bell is re-arrested and questioned by detectives once again. He maintained that he was not in the car park around that time on that day. He was then shown the CCTV, which put him in the car park for an hour and him leaving that car park. And he admitted then that he had been in the car park that day and he actually admitted that he'd been in, it was called the Lonely Staircase because there was no exit from it to any main part of the car park. It was where Terry was actually killed. But Bell is adamant he never saw Terry or took part in her attack. Philip Bell had said during that hour between him going to the car park and him coming out of the car park, he'd been in his uh, sleeping area smoking quite a large amount of cannabis. What he said was that he was, his words, stoned on cannabis, which was illegal. That's why he lied to the police about where he was. During that lost hour Bell couldn't account for, he claimed to have smoked over seven grams of cannabis, but evidence from a drug specialist would blow holes in his story. We were able to disprove that through the use of a, a drug expert who was able to analyse the CCTV of him walking in and him walking out and saying, walking out, he was not under the influence of cannabis, such as would have been the case if he'd consumed what he said he had. It seems the suspect who claimed he was high was walking far too steady on his feet. He couldn't be walking in that way if he was smoking a large amount of cannabis in a short period of time. For the team's advisers at the Crown Prosecution Service, the case against Bell is beginning to stack up. CCTV evidence was absolutely key in this case because it provided evidence to undermine Mr Bell's initial account that he hadn't returned to the car park. And it also gave us evidence that he changed his clothing as well during the what we called the lost hour between him entering the car park with Terry and then leaving the car park after he murdered her. 
Meanwhile, the forensics lab also has exciting news. An item of Bell's clothing that was seized during his first arrest has also yielded a result. In the CCTV of Philip Bell in Tunbridge Wells, he was uh, wearing a very distinctive hooded top. It was a fat farm hoodie. And that hoodie was submitted to the laboratory for examination. And on it was a blood stain. It was a very small blood stain, about the size of a penny, that matched Terry Edmonds. And the lab finds more evidence on Bell's belongings that were seized by police in the stairwell where he slept. On his sleeping bag, two large stains of blood. Through DNA testing, these are also confirmed as Terry's. It was absolutely pivotal in the case because it demonstrated that there was a very clear link between Terry Edmonds, her being injured, and the belongings of Philip Bell and that stairwell. To add to that, the pink sheet found near Terry's body that's suspected of being used to smother her throws up more clues in the forensics lab. Not only did it have the blood of Terry Edmonds on it, but it also had a very partial footwear mark, and that footwear mark was matched to Philip Bell's training shoes. So collectively, and I suppose circumstantially, things were starting to build as a case against Philip Bell. Is this the final nail in the coffin for the prime suspect? Forensic investigators find a semen stain on Terry's underwear. That's a partial DNA match to Philip Bell. Today, a local man, Philip Bell, has been charged with the murder of Terry Edmonds. With the evidence stacked against him, the 21-year-old homeless drug dealer is charged with the murder of Terry Edmonds. The news spreads through the town of Tunbridge Wells like wildfire. It meant for the first time we could actually legally name him as the man in connection to Terry's murder. When Philip Bell was charged, I think there was enormous relief that perhaps they had found Terry's killer. Before that, there had been a little bit of impatience from the public. Next day, Bell appears at Seven Oaks Magistrates Court charged with Terry's killing. The scene is set for his trial at Crown Court just three months later. So when there was this breakthrough and it was publicised, I think people felt finally Terry's killer will be brought to justice. In Tunbridge Wells, 17-year-old Terry Edmonds has been found strangled and sexually assaulted, then stuffed inside a suitcase. With the evidence stacked against him, 21-year-old homeless man Philip Bell has been arrested and charged with her murder. He's spotted on CCTV following Terry into a car park, and his hoodie has a stain of blood belonging to his victim. Detectives have built up a chilling theory of how he carried out the attack. He tried it on with her, she refused, and he then, he then attacked her, killed her, and sexually assaulted her. But having done that, he was a homeless person with no car, he had no means to get rid of the body, but he had a suitcase. So he put the body in a fetal position in the suitcase. A year after Terry's disappearance, Philip Bell's trial begins at Maidstone Crown Court. He pleads not guilty to her murder. The thing that struck me about him was he was completely emotionless the whole time. You look into their eyes and, and there was nothing there. It, it was quite chilling, actually. But as the trial progresses, police realise convincing the court of Bell's guilt may not be an open and shut case. The case against Bell relied entirely on circumstantial evidence. There was no smoking gun, there was no witness who saw him kill Terry Edmonds. 
I think that Philip Bell also had a very good defence barrister who was able to just chip away at the little bits of, of evidence. It became really a massive trial. I, I was giving evidence for, for days on end. And before long, Bell's defence team has a trick up their sleeve to try and raise doubts in the jury. They point the finger at another rough sleeper in the same car park, one of Bell's associates. The man had a conviction for manslaughter. And because he lived in the car park, it was suggested by the defence that he was the murderer. Not only that, but the defence's new suspect could undermine one of the team's key pieces of evidence, the footprint on the pink sheet used to smother Terry. The man had a pair of Converse trainers found in his possession, which were linked to the pink sheet found at the scene with a bloody footprint that matched that pair of trainers. Following a dramatic trial lasting six weeks, the jury retires. After 22 hours spent deliberating, they failed to reach a verdict. For Kent Police and the prosecution team, their worst fears have come true. All the evidence against Philip Bell, it seemed very strong. So it was very disappointing, very disappointing for, for Terry's mum not being able to get any justice and for the, the rest of her family. With no verdict reached by the jury, the judge orders a retrial. Seven months later, a second trial begins and a brand new jury hears the case against Philip Bell. But again, we had the same situation with evidence being chipped away at by the defence team. I was thinking, oh no, not again, because I was really concerned that it would be the same Groundhog Day kind of scenario. This time, the defence focuses on Bell's hoodie. They claim there was an innocent explanation for Terry's blood on it. They suggested that Philip Bell had brushed past the area where Terry's blood was and got it on his top. Again, I think that what they did was they raised a doubt about that and the jury just couldn't be sure of it. Following 19 hours of deliberation, the jury has news. I think it's fair to say you could cut the atmosphere in that courtroom, in Maidstone Crown Court, with a knife. Once again, a jury has failed to reach a verdict. This is another massive blow for, for Terry Edmonds' family. They'd sat now through two lengthy trials. There was, on my part, a real sense of um, shock and disappointment when the jury were una unable to uh, return a verdict and um, then having to decide what we were going to do. The team is on the verge of calling it quits. Now, if we had done that, Bell would have walked free and Terry's killer would never have been brought to justice. But in a last-ditch effort to save the case, the prosecution tries for something rarely attempted in British legal history. A third trial of the same defendant. And so we argue that it was in the interests of justice to go a third time, which is unusual. It was the right thing to do that we had an overwhelming case, that Terry had been murdered by Philip Bell. It's a close call, but the judge sides with the prosecution and agrees to keep Bell in custody until the retrial. So the team has one last chance to put Bell behind bars. If the case fails, then he is going to walk free and he could be dangerous. So the prosecution goes back to basics. First, they tackle Bell's claim that he brushed past Terry's blood, left on the stairwell. Forensic scientists run tests using the same small amount of blood that was found on Bell's hoodie. This tiny amount would have started drying if he'd touched it after the attack. So you can see that if the blood has started to dry quite considerably, the stains start to break up. They're quite gritty, they're quite flaky. But the stain on Bell's top seemed fresh. 
questioning his version of events. The blood stain on the hooded top was not flaky. It was fresh looking blood that had been transferred. So it demonstrated that it wasn't drying blood. So that blood must have transferred very quickly after it was available, which started to put Philip Bell being involved in the assault on Terry Edmonds and being exposed to her blood after she was injured. Not only is the forensic evidence building better than before, this time the prosecution have also found a new star witness who has come forward to the police. A 15-year-old girl came and gave her account about how she had been invited to go to the stairwell that Philip Bell was staying in. And quite chillingly, she described what we believed had happened to Terry her being straddled by him and being bruised by him and him trying to assault her. But very fortunately for her, somebody came and disturbed them and she was able to escape. That was just exactly how we imagined that the, the attack had taken place on Terry. And you could hear a pin drop. It was compelling evidence and it showed in law that he had what we call a propensity to commit this type of offence. As the prosecution's case seems to get stronger, Bell's testimony on the stand just falls apart. He admits being on the stairwell landing at the time of Terry's attack, but says he saw nothing. He's within 10 feet of Terry being murdered and yet sees and hears nothing. It was fanciful. So a jury considers the evidence against Bell for a third time. Just three hours later, they announce their decision. Guilty. It was a day of jubilation, really, for the family. There were loud shouts and cheers as the verdict was announced in Maidstone Crown Court. There was an outpouring of pent-up emotion that had been there for a long period of time. It was extremely satisfying when we were able to um, hear the guilty verdict and realise that we'd um, achieved some sort of justice for Terry's family. Philip Bell is eventually sentenced to 28 years in jail. He was evil. That's how the judge described him after the trial, and that's a fair description of him. Justice is a consolation for the family, but it will never bring their beloved daughter back. Terry was a bright, intelligent girl, and she had a long life to look forward to that was cruelly taken away by Philip Bell, for no reason, really. And the case has left its mark on the quiet Kent town of Tunbridge Wells. I think Tunbridge Wells has never really got over the murder of Terry Edmonds, and I think the wounds are still there in Tunbridge Wells because Terry was part of our community and a lovely young woman. You could feel that fear and sadness that this had happened in our town. There was a 999 call received from dog walkers that had found a suitcase on a lay-by just near the road. People came across the suitcase and opened it and inside was the remains of a person. Local people found it extraordinary that such an incident could happen here. For a murder to happen, not only a murder but a murder on this scale, it was absolutely shocking for the community.
we had knowledge that he had over £270,000 worth of debt and he was struggling to pay off those debts. There was blood absolutely everywhere in that room, on the sofa, on the walls and on the ceiling. Through extreme measures, he used the alternative of planning the murder of his friend. Tintwistle is an idyllic village nestled on the edge of the Peak District. Tintwistle is a typical Peak District village. It's got a mixture of beautiful stone cottages. It's on the banks of the Longdendale Valley, and behind it are the Tintwistle Moors, known as the Nar and the Lower Moor. Um, and it has stunning views over the Longdendale Valley and the five reservoirs. A very parochial village where people can leave your back door open, no problems. In Tintwistle, everyone knows each other. It's a very, you know, neighbourly feel. Um, it's a very close-knit community. We've got a lot of people who have a lot of very good neighbours and I think everybody supports each other. In terms of crime rates in Tintwistle, it's fairly, you know, non-existent. But all this is about to change when the peace is shattered early one morning. On the 10th of October, there was a 999 call received from dog walkers that had found a suitcase on a lay-by just near the road. The location was uh, on a main road that went between uh, Manchester and Sheffield, and it dipped down a little bit into, into Derbyshire. Um, it was a, a car park off the main road, but it was an area that was quite popular for walkers. As you come into Tintwistle from the east, you go along what's called the Woodhead Pass, and uh, this particular suitcase was dumped just over the wall as you go into the village beside the first reservoir. As I remember, it was like just this uh, people passing by this lay-by and came across a suitcase and opened it and inside the suitcase was the remains of a person. Police are immediately dispatched to the area. There's quite a long drive really from the, uh, from the point where I got the call to the point where I arrived at the scene. Just to give you some idea around the geography, when I first got the call, I was in Derby, uh, which is which is here. The deposition site was all the way to the north of the county, to the north of Derbyshire, and as you can see, it's right at the very tip of the county. Upon arrival, they are met with a gruesome sight. It looks like the suitcase has been set on fire, and inside uh, that suitcase, uh, we have a body of a man whose head has been removed, whose arms have been removed, and whose feet have been removed. It was a Samsonite suitcase um, that was in an extremely charred state. Um, but then it, it became apparent, and we had a human torso um, that had been extremely um, cruelly dismembered and, uh, and burnt. As a crime, this is really, really vicious. For somebody to remove all the limbs of a body, never mind commit the murder itself. Derbyshire Constabulary launch a murder investigation, and news of the horrific find soon spreads around the village. Oh, like chicken pox. Everybody talks about it, we all know about it. You go in the local shops, have you heard? In Tintwistle, it's a really neighbourly community. Everyone knows each other. You know, if there's gossip, someone down the road will know about it in 10 minutes or so. Considering the crime rate was fairly non-existent for a murder to happen, not only a murder, but a murder on this scale, it was absolutely, it was completely shocking for the community. I think um, local people found it extraordinary that such an incident could happen here. I think like all major crimes that happen in what everybody would regard as somewhere quiet and peace-loving, it adds to people's fear um, that something else could happen or something else could happen as a result of it. Police immediately cordon off the crime scene. 
big issue you've got here is right in the open. So there's two things. There's the weather. So uh, rain can come and wash away your evidence. But secondly, you've got this your privacy. This is a really busy road. There's lots of traffic coming through and you need to protect the priv privacy of that individual. That's really important. Really what you want to do is secure and preserve as much evidence as you can. So there would have been things like um, identifying where the scene is, making sure that it was cordoned off, that there was enough police officers to ensure that nobody stumbled across the scene. Beyond the scene, you might be looking at further searches. Has anything discarded, any clothing, any weapons, etc. So this particular point is very important from a forensic point of view. So you would want to be able to get some of your experts down, you want your crime scene manager, you'd really want your pathologist to be coming down to have a look at the scene, just so they have a full understanding of, of what's here, so that they can do a better job down the line. And what I would do there is I'd have a discussion with the crime scene manager about the best way of removing the body to, to a hospital, um, but also making sure that we didn't lose any evidence while we were in that process, because the evidence that you might lose might be the only evidence that you get that, that helps you with the case. There's a potential loss of evidence, so there'll be some sampling requirements there and then, even in the circumstances where a body's been burnt. For example, there may well be fibres that have been transferred from the offender to the body or alternatively to the suitcase that haven't been damaged. It's really important to pick those up at that point. The body is removed and police focus on one thing. But I think when you look at the wider picture around this, this is, is somebody's life. This is that the they've lost. And, you know, what I really want to do is find out who, who the family is, who are the relatives and the friends of this individual, and they need informing at the earliest opportunity. This was going to be a huge challenge for the police now because there's absolutely nothing to go by. They've just found a torso. There's, no, there's nothing to identify the person, no fingerprints. When you're looking at the difficulty presented by not being able to make an identification, um, the first things that we considered were things like the police database, and then we started looking at people who were missing, but because we had quite a wide geographical area, it was looking at people who were perhaps missing from West Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, Greater Manchester, as well as Derbyshire. But it's an arterial route, could have, could have been from anywhere. With very little to go on, the pressure is on for the police to try to identify the body. You head towards the things that you are quite confident that will bring about an identification. Um, but then when the obvious start to start to go, then it progressively becomes more and more difficult. Um, and you start considering any other locations or any other information that you may get that you think will help you identify who this person was. So it made it a really difficult inquiry where we were having to be very, very precise around the investigative tactics that we used to try and find out who were the people who were involved. Whilst the police await lab results from the pathologist's examination of the body, their attention turns to other lines of inquiry. So the first point of call for the police now would have been to conduct local inquiries, um, asking people if they'd seen anything, if they'd heard anything. When these things initially happen, uh, all sorts of stories start to abound. But the question on everybody's lips is, who is the victim? Foremost in my mind was, um, there is a family somewhere whose loved one has been murdered um, and they don't know about it. In the picturesque Peak District, police have launched a murder investigation after an unidentified body was discovered in a suitcase which had been set alight. So the condition of the body when we found it, the head had been removed, um, both hands had been removed and the feet had been removed. There were two things that um, I, I sort of realised quite quickly. One, that that was a deposition site. That wasn't where the murder had taken place. That was where the body had been um, uh, put, placed afterwards. Uh, and the second thing was, um, and it was around whether the victim and the offender knew each other. And I took the view that why, why would one take the steps to hide somebody's identity if they didn't know each other? 
So I, I sort of realised in my own mind that if I worked out who the victim was, I would be able to work out who the offender was. And if I worked out who the offender was, I'd be able to work out who the victim was. Unable to identify their victim, police await the results of the post-mortem. It's slightly unusual here. There was no cause of death. So this tells us that there was, there was no um, marks or scars or any wounds on the body parts that we had recovered. And clearly the, uh, the victim's head had been removed. When we looked at the information that we did have from the post-mortem, um, this was a, a light-skinned male, um, and that's all that we were able really to glean from that. From the post-mortem, there were no marks, scars, tattoos, or anything that would have assisted us making a, an identification. Police trawl the missing persons database for any clues as to who their victim could be. At the time, there was a lot of missing persons cases, so this could have been absolutely anybody. There's quite a lot of missing people reported every single day in Derbyshire. And it was a case of refreshing those every single day because the, the person may not be reported on day one or day two or day three, but every single day going through those de the detail of who those individuals were and seeing if we could make a connection uh, between the body that we got and that person who was missing. With little to go on, Derbyshire Constabulary hold a press conference. The purpose of today's press conference is to ask for the public's help to identify the victim. We are working with other forces to ascertain whether our victim may have been reported missing in a neighbouring county. But we recognise that he might not have been reported missing at all. We are therefore asking members of the public to come forward if they have not seen a neighbour or a friend or a colleague or indeed any members of their family recently. A special call centre has been set up to take calls from across the UK and we are urging people to provide information in relation to this murder investigation. Information soon starts to filter into the police. It became apparent that a number of dog walkers had seen um, the suitcase but hadn't realised exactly what was inside. So in order to better understand the, the time frame that we're looking at and understand when the body may have been put in the car park, uh, we did substantial inquiries with people who'd been on the road. We were asking for people who'd got dash cam footage or people that had driven past. Um, and there were a few positive responses out of that which were able to tell us that the fire had been set late the night before. With three different drivers claiming to have seen a fire around 11.30pm on the 9th of October, officers on the ground can now focus on who was in the area around that time in a bid to identify the potential killer. So that was really useful from the initial investigation point of view to be able to really narrow those timelines so you could concentrate on that time period and work out from there what the offender had done, where he'd been, where he'd likely to travel to and from. Police now ramp up their inquiries. There was a, a bolt out of the blue and, uh, and we got a conversation, we, we got a phone call in from South Yorkshire um, to inform us that there was actually a, an AMPR camera on the A628. So um, the, the phone call that we got on that day was, uh, do you know you've got an AMPR camera on the 628? And, no, no, we didn't, but thanks very much for telling us. That's really great. Police immediately trawl through the automatic number plate recognition cameras to establish which vehicles had passed through the area on the night in question. The police um, followed ANPR camera footage and located a Mercedes vehicle that triggered the camera just after 11 o'clock on Sunday the 9th, the evening before, um, and then didn't actually make it all the way across Woodhead Pass Road um, and to trigger the other AMPR camera at the other end. It was the only vehicle that passed in the window of opportunity. So every other vehicle only went in one direction, either towards Manchester or towards Yorkshire. All the vehicles, over 200, that had travelled along that road within the time period, um, down to one that had turned around and returned back to the Manchester area. That was a strong indication that that vehicle was the one that deposited the body here on the night of the 9th. After
after 10 days of round-the-clock investigations and still having no clue as to the identity of their victim or suspect, this discovery is key. The Mercedes triggered the camera on the evening before between 23.09 and 23.26. So straight away that was something I was very interested in and we started to make some inquiries as to who might be the owner and what might be the significance of that vehicle. This was absolutely key in the investigation. After 10 days of not finding anything, they needed to find out who this silver Mercedes belonged to. As it happened, the, uh, the vehicle didn't have any insurance. Um, and so there was a reason to go and stop it and speak to the driver and, um, and have a look at the vehicle. After further investigation, police discover that the vehicle is registered to someone living in Manchester. So the owner of the vehicle uh, was somebody called Ming Jiang. Once the vehicle had been identified, it was registered to uh, Ming Jiang, and therefore this triggered for the police to monitor him, make inquiries as to where he lived, um, inquiries of where he went. There was so much pressure on the police. At this point in the investigation, it was very time sensitive. After 10 days, they really needed to find this person. At this point, the person who committed the crime could have run away, they could have covered up, or they could have very much so committed again. Initial inquiries reveal Ming Zhang lives in Manchester, so Derbyshire Constabulary enlists the help of their colleagues over there. When Greater Manchester Police uh, assisted us, they were able to uh, locate the vehicle um, and because it was driven without any insurance, we were able to seize it. Um, and when we seized the vehicle, we were then able to forensically examine it. And what I was looking for in that forensic examination was to find any evidence that might link to the, to the body that we've got and the scene that we've, we'd preserved some days before. The police found a speck of blood in the rear that was the size of a 10p coin. This was a really, really big moment in the investigation. What I would be looking to find out there is there's a blood spot in the boot uh, of the vehicle, the same as the blood that we found at the scene. So the DNA was sent away for comparison. It was the longest 24 hours I can imagine. Eventually it came back and it came back with the news that we were really hoping for and that was that the blood in the boot matched the DNA of the blood at the scene. The blood match in the boot of the car puts Ming Zhang at the forefront of the investigation. I felt this was the first time we were getting a breakthrough and first time we were getting an indication as to what may have taken place here. So as soon as we got the positive information about the, uh, the DNA hit, it was a case of, let's get this person uh, arrested at the earliest opportunity. So Ming Zhang was arrested on the 20th of October. They'd attended a casino in Manchester where they believed he was, and he was arrested at that location. Now that the police have Ming Zhang in custody for questioning, Time is of the essence to find evidence linking him to the murder. What is also uh, part of the inquiry is to start doing an evidential search around him to understand where he lived, what his movements were, um, and whether there was any other evidence that we'd be able to glean from his home address. The police searched the home address and they found blood stains all over the carpet. Um, there was blood dispersion across all of the walls. They had been um, painted over um, and quite a, quite a shoddy um, clean-up had taken place. It was an extensive clean-up, but there was still blood throughout the flat and in the bathroom. There was uh, traces of blood absolutely everywhere that weren't immediately apparent to the eye. Um, but there were things like uh, the blood had seeped through the laminate flooring. There was blood that was soaked into the cushions um, on the sofa. There was blood on the walls and on the ceiling. So the scene was a really rich source of evidence for us. The main evidence we got were two finger marks in blood. So we got one under a table. And the evidence you're really looking for there is the offender's fingerprint 
in the victim's blood. And getting that in two places was very, very critical evidence. At this point, it's absolutely safe for the police to say that the murder took place in this apartment. Ten days into the investigation of the body in the suitcase found in a Derbyshire village, police have discovered a car linked to the murder and have made an arrest. A forensics team um, investigated the car, they swabbed the blood, um, this matched the torso that was found in the suitcase. So at this point, the police were then able to arrest Mr Ming Zhang. Forensic tests reveal the blood on the torso in the suitcase is a match for the blood in Zhang's flat in Manchester. Making Ming Zhang their number one suspect. So the investigation moved over to Manchester because it became clear from the Derbyshire point of view that the offence had actually taken place in Manchester. As a result of their inquiries, that took them to the flats at Falconwood Way in Beswick. And as a result of what they found there, they felt very strongly that the, that was actually the place of the murder. And so as a result of that, that would then become a Manchester investigation. But police are no closer to identifying their victim. So as the inquiry goes on, the, the stress and the, and the pressure build. As a senior investigating officer, um, you, it's a privilege to do that role. Uh, but you do take the responsibility of having to investigate the death of somebody and you owe that responsibility to the family of the victim. So I was really concerned about getting, finding out who that was and getting that information to them at the earliest opportunity. However, searches of their suspect and his car have led to a discovery. When we did um, the evidential search of the Mercedes vehicle, we found some banking documents of another person called Yang Lu. He had certain possessions on his person. At the time, he had his passport, he had his bank cards. And that led us to an address in Salford uh, at Media City. And there were some lines of inquiry that we needed to conduct at, at that address and find out what the relationship was uh, with this person uh, and how they fitted into the inquiry. Police immediately sent officers to Yang Lu's address. There was no answer, it was nowhere to be seen by anybody. Um, so I made the decision that we were going to force entry into that apartment and find out really who this person was. So we forced entry into the address at Media City. Um, nothing particularly remarkable about the address, uh, but it, what it did allow us to do was take some items from there, which we knew the owner of uh, that apartment would have left their DNA on. So very quickly, we were able to send that away for analysis. Finally, there is a breakthrough. Results come back matching Yang Lu's DNA to the torso, as well as the blood found in Ming Zhang's flat and car. Almost two weeks after the discovery, police have the name of their victim. So what we did find out was that Yang Lu was a 27-year-old male, uh, originally from China. Yang Lu came to the UK in 2000 um, to study, where he went to the University of Leeds. Um, his family actually worked really, really hard to save um, money so that he could study in the UK and achieve uh, his goals and his dreams. He finished his master's degree, and after that he, he stayed here and uh, uh, become a uh, shares and stock trader. He'd not bought any of his family uh, with him over over here. So if you look at the reasons why he may not have been reported missing, um, his family simply didn't know that he, he wasn't where he should have been. Police now have the harrowing task of informing their victim's family. This was a really difficult case from a family point of view. Under normal circumstances, we'd want to inform the family in person. And in the end, we actually had to make the call to the family in order to, the, to inform them. That's something that we wouldn't normally do under any circumstances, but unfortunately, with the distance involved, we, we had no other option. 
I arranged for contact through Interpol with the Chinese authorities in order to let the family know. In the meantime, we allocated family liaison officers in order that we could make the process as smooth as possible. Yang's family were absolutely devastated when they found out you know, their only son had been murdered. They're not only murdered, but in such a vicious way. And then they arrived in the UK uh, in the second week of November. Yang was very close to his family. They spoke on the phone near enough every single day. Um, he actually vowed to go back to China and look after his family if one of them was to fall ill. And I think that just shows the, the tight-knit relationship they have because he'd built himself this fantastic life in the UK and he was really willing to give that up to go back and look after his family. When the family was here, then I helped them uh, in different ways because uh, they are not... They, uh, they can't speak English, so uh, most of the time that if they have something uh, do not understand uh, about the uh, police procedure and uh, I have to explain them. They were completely grief-stricken. They had lost their only son who had come to the United Kingdom to study at university. He was a very clever, young, academic man um, and a very bright young man and they were deprived of their son. With time running out to hold their suspect in custody, police need to work fast to build enough evidence to charge him. Ming Zhang is a danger to the public and we would really want to be in a position where he'd be charged at that point. The secondary issue is he's a big flight risk. We'd be worried about him um, kind of moving back to China or elsewhere. We had to prove that he was the person that had committed that murder. We knew he was involved and could prove that to the extent, and we then had to build a case. There's no doubt that Ming Zhang tried to cover his uh, tracks quite extensively, but the problem is there was just too much evidence. The evidence there in particular was extremely strong. It's almost the best evidence you can find at a scene, which was Zhang Lu's blood and Ming Zhang's fingerprint. Police now believe Ming Zhang murdered Yang Lu in his flat, dismembered his body, and dumped his torso in a suitcase before setting light to it. But they need to work out the link between the pair and establish when the murder happened, so trawl CCTV footage in the days leading up to the discovery of the suitcase. CCTV footage revealed a man getting off the tram in Manchester. He crossed the road to meet another man and they went in the direction of a flat in Beswick. That tram stop was the closest one to where Ming Jiang's home address was. The male he met up with perfectly fit the description of Ming Jiang. And in addition to that, we had telephone evidence that showed the two phones of Ming Jiang and Yang Lu came together. And interestingly, from that point onwards, the phones always remained together. And that was the very last time that Yang Lu was seen. With the evidence building, police make a decision. So I authorised one charge of murder. Ming Zhang denies any involvement in the murder. So the police and prosecution need to build a case for trial and establish a motive, meaning they have to delve deeper into the lives of the two men. Yang Lu was definitely a responsible young man. Um, he invested in stocks and shares and he, he knew how to make money. He was very clever in that sense. Um, he'd built himself this brand new life in the UK. He, he really had a bright future ahead of him. Yang really enjoyed gambling. He was a very big gambler. Um, he'd go to casinos quite often. Um, he always gambled within his means, though. He was never irresponsible in that respect. Even though he had the money to gamble, he never um, went above and beyond. So Ming Zhang uh, was in a very different situation to Yang Lu. Ming Zhang was originally from China. Uh, he moved over to the UK. He lived in the Basic area in North Manchester. Uh, he rented that flat. At the time of the murder, he really was in serious debt problems. He'd spent quite a long time at casinos. He was a regular gambler. In fact, so much so that he had VIP status. We believe that they met in a casino uh, when they share the same interest uh, to gamble. Um, they met in the uh, Manchester casino. 
But Yang Lu could never have imagined that their relationship could be so deadly. Ming Zhang was very well known in the casino community. Um, in some casinos, he had quite specialized status due to the large amounts of money that he was gambling. Yet in other casinos, he had markers on him due to his erratic and volatile behavior. It was my understanding that he was a great fun guy to be around when he was winning, but it was a very, very different case uh, when he was losing. He lost a huge amount of money and as far as we know is sort of a 200,000 pounds debt and he's been chasing by the uh, the debtor, uh, the creditor uh, within the community. It was the Crown's case that Ming Jiang had accrued extensive debts. We had knowledge that he had historically acquired over £270,000 worth of debt within two casinos. Um, he was struggling to pay off those debts. We knew that he had pawned um, some wristwatches for over £15,000 to try and keep the debtors at bay. Getting more and more desperate to pay off his debts, it appears Ming Zhang hatched an evil plan. Ming Zhang was in huge amounts of debt. He had no income or wherewithal with which to repay that debt. And the only way he believed he could do that was either through his addiction of gambling and um, waiting for the big win or through extreme measures he used the alternative of planning um, planning the murder of his friend. When the police found Ming Zhang, he was actually in possession of Mr Yang Lu's passport and his bank cards. So at this point, it's safe to assume that he was trying to assume his identity. So Ming Zhang had taken Yang Lu's life and then he took his identity. He basically used all his personal information in order to extract money through his bank cards. He even tried to sell his flat and he was making uh, good progress on that at the point at which he'd been arrested. There was nothing that he wouldn't do in order to extract as much money and value out of Yang Lu. In Manchester, Ming Zhang's trial for the murder of Yang Lu begins. So the trial was conducted in April of 2017. Um, shortly prior to the trial hearing, we did meet with the victim's parents and uh, we had to reassure them that um, we would do our utmost to, uh, to be able to obtain justice for their son. The court hears how Ming Zhang had a checkered history. Ming Zhang was a Hong Kong national. Um, before he came to the UK, he was working as cabin crew for a German airline where he was actually convicted for credit card fraud. The police found that he had convictions in Germany for shoplifting, convictions for identity fraud and forgery of documents in Switzerland. Um, he had convictions for credit card fraud in Scotland. So as a result of that, as the reviewing lawyer, it was my job then to write international letters of request. I had to make um, formal requests to Germany and Switzerland to obtain evidence of those convictions, which we then subsequently at the trial hearing submitted as evidence of bad character. The prosecution believes Ming Zhang was planning to use his experience of identity fraud to build a new life for himself. It appeared quite clearly that Ming Zhang understood his way around the financial system and the kind of things that he did and the way that he adopted the identity, uh, for example, by using Yang Lu's phone to contact banks, etc. Now, that showed quite a little bit of knowledge of how to basically defraud and use identity theft to his advantage. This was premeditated, it was planned. Um, he had devised a plan as to how he was going to assume his victim's identity um, and obtain all of his, um, his, his assets um, and, and walk away. Um, 
He was probably going to walk away from his debts, um, take what money he could get from his victim and return to China. I believe that would have been his plan. The motive behind the murder was quite clearly greed. Um, it was obvious that Ming Zhang understood that Yang Lu had a lot of money. He lived in a nice area of Manchester. He owned, he owned his own flat. He dabbled in stocks and shares. And uh, the concept that, he, that, that they'd had together, uh, we believe that there would have been some understanding from Ming Zhang's, Ming Zhang's point of view that Yang Lu was pretty wealthy. During the trial, Ming Zhang's story changes several times. Ming Zhang showed no remorse whatsoever throughout the whole process. He came out with bizarre and incredulous accounts, changing the overall story on a number of occasions. Initially, he claimed that Yang Lu was a, an escort and that they were in a relationship. There was absolutely no evidence to support that. So he wasn't consistent in his account that he was providing to the police. Um, he did pursue that through to the trial hearing um, and maintained that um, it was a different Chinese male called Mr. Wong who had committed the act of murder um, and he tried to distance himself by using this fictional character. He later on claimed that there was a kind of third party uh, gangster type individual who was involved that Yang Lu owed money to. Again, from an investigation point of view, we were able to um, show that that simply wasn't the case. Ming Zhang fabricated Mr. Wong and he gave the phone number to the police. Um, however, when the police checked the record of the phone, and it's, uh, it's find out that the phone number is only uh, uh, created a day before uh, they believed Liu Yong died. So all the explanations that Ming Zhang provided were easily discounted and showed that he was just making things up as he went along. The jury has shown CCTV from the night police believe Yang Lu was murdered in a bid to prove that Ming Zhang was the last to see him. The evidence we used, we had um, a, a digital sequence of events that displayed all of the CCTV footage and the appropriate stills. So we had the stills um, showing that um, Ming Jiang was friends with uh, the victim and that they had attended the casino together on the 3rd of October. And then subsequently, um, Ming Jiang had clearly lured him to his flat um, on the 5th of October. And we had a still digital photo of uh, Yang Lu um, leaving the Metrolink uh, tram stop at Velo Park, which was the closest one to Ming Zhang's home address. From a CCTV point of view, that was the last point at which Yang Lu had been seen. So that was on the 5th of October. So his movements shortly after the time that we believe that he had killed um, Yang Lu, um, he used the bank cards that he'd acquired. He used them at B&Q to purchase cleaning products, um, he had, uh, paint with which to paint the flat. He went to the petrol station on numerous occasions and he was seen to be filling one, if not two, containers of petrol, which we then subsequently believe that he used to set the body on fire. Having killed his supposed friend and made attempts to clean the evidence, it appears Ming Zhang goes back to doing what he loves best. In the early hours of the 6th of October, Ming Zhang spent 30 minutes at the casino. He also spent time at the casino after the deposition. So on the, in the early hours of the 10th of October, he spent around four hours. And if you can imagine, he's literally just taken the torso of a body. He's dumped it up in Tins Whistle and then he set it on fire, returned back to his flat, and the first thing he does is head to the casino to spend Yang Lu's money and gamble. His, his actions aren't the actions of what you would expect a normal person to do, uh, and it's a terrible thing to, to murder somebody, but then to murder somebody and dismember the body and then dump it and set on fire, it's, there's, um, it, it's just an incredibly callous act 
um, and it probably speaks a lot about his character. After hearing the evidence, the jury retires to consider its verdict. So the, the jury in this case uh, sat for four weeks and under normal circumstances you generally expect around about a day, day's deliberation per week. So under normal circumstances it would, it would take four days to, to, to come to a decision. But in this case it only took them four hours and that shows you really how overwhelming the evidence was. After weeks of evidence um, is a very short period of time. Um, and I believe would demonstrate that they were absolutely sure in a very short space of time that Ming Jiang um, was guilty of this offence. At the point that they uh, gave their verdict, Ming Jiang was completely emotionless. He showed nothing at all. At that point, he went back into custody and sentencing took place a week later. The judge actually sentenced him in his absence because he refused to come to court. The presiding judge made a point of stating that the starting point for a sentence would be 30 years due to it being um, solely um, the sole purpose being for gain and in this case for money. Um, however, he outlined aggravating features such as the extensive um, dismemberment of the body, the complete lack of remorse, um, and the misleading of evidence. And he made a point of saying that it might be that the authorities never deem him to be safe to be returned to the community and that he could spend the rest of his life um, in prison. On the 2nd of May, 2017, Ming Zhang is sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 33 years. He has never revealed the whereabouts of Yang Lu's limbs or head. The saddest thing about this murder is Ming Jiang's greed caused the loss of the life of a, a young 36-year-old man, um, leaving behind two very grief-stricken, distraught parents. His family didn't know the last time they spoke to him on the phone, the last time they saw him in person, was going to be the last time. Um, I think, yeah, it's really, it's really devastating that they never got to say goodbye to their only son. was made at 7.44 that evening. All that Mandy Joseph could scream down the phone at that point was, help, help. There were sounds of a gunshot and a woman screaming for help. And then the line went dead. There's been a murder. I said, well, what do you mean there's been a murder? He said, yeah, they found two women murdered up by the garage. It's got to be them. It's something that is totally unbelievable. To kill them both, it was just devastating. And you just could never, ever imagine something like that happening in Oncliffe. It was vicious in the extreme. When officers reviewed the CCTV, they identified a vehicle that came down the pathway around the time of the murder. And these are the people responsible for the deaths. Hawkliffe. A quintessentially English village situated in the heart of Bedfordshire, best known for being the birthplace of British explorer Arthur Henry Newman. Hockliffe is a smallish village uh, in mid Bedfordshire, um, straddles the A5. It's a quiet village. Um, it's on a route between Dunstable in the south and Milton Keynes in the north. Everyone knows everyone, really, so it's, it's quite a nice little place to, to live and to stay and to be, really. It's a lovely local community with a pub and a lovely little school. There's not a lot of trouble. 
it's a good little village. I'd say the community is quite close-knit. A lot of people know a lot of other people, so everyone kind of knows everybody. And central to the community and village life was Iris Jones and her husband. Iris was a much-loved figure in the village, well-known in the village. She'd lived here for years and years. Um, she was known especially for the fact that she had fostered something like 120 children, um, she and her husband, um, over a sort of 30-year period, starting in the 50s and, and going through to the mid-1980s. She was a woman who had fostered over 100 children. The local community held her in the highest regard. She literally was an angel walking amongst us. Auntie was, once you got to know her, she had a heart of gold. And she'd do anything for anybody. She was much loved, uh, a caring, compassionate person who opened up her home uh, to countless children, uh, less fortunate. I mean, it become a way of life to her, fostering several children there who we actually grew up with. And as I say, she was, that, that was her life, kids, really. Iris's husband died in 1993, leaving Iris a widower. She remained close to her children, including her foster daughter, Mandy, whom she relied on. Mandy Jones was fostered by Iris when she was about four years old. She's um, had a proper mother-daughter relationship um, throughout her whole life. Mandy was 34 years old. Um, she was a carer herself. She worked in the care industry. Her whole life was about caring for others. And when Iris's husband died, uh, she moved back in with her foster mother to care for her in her declining health. She was a caring girl. There was no nothing she wouldn't do for you. Iris uh, walked with the aid of a, a, a frame uh, and walking stick. She had heart problems. She had diabetes and she had failing eyesight. In later years, as Iris's health declined, Mandy took a much more active role in the care of her foster mother, uh, looking after her, caring for, making sure she had everything she needed. Well, please, how can I help? The 999 call was made at 7.44 that evening and it was made by Mandy Joseph. All that Mandy Joseph could scream down the phone at that point was, help, help. Then the line went dead. If a 999 call is cut off or goes dead for whatever reason, um, the operator will review what they've already heard. In this case, there was a, a, a woman screaming for help, so they would then dispatch units to the house. Mandy's screams were not the only disturbing sound the police operator heard. There were sounds of a gunshot, a, a woman screaming for help, and the control room inspector would then decide on the appropriate level of, uh, of response because of the high level of risk to both the officers attending and the public. It's a proportionate response to dispatch a firearms team. In this case, it was always going to be a firearms team. The call handers did try to call back and there was no response, but the police were able to trace where the call had been made from. And that resulted in police being sent to the property, including armed police officers, uh, who forcefully gained entry into the house that evening. The house where the shooting had taken place was up a, a gravel drive and situated behind a garage forecourt. 
there's a petrol station, and by the side of it, there was a track that led down to this detached house. Upon arrival, the armed officers were met with a gruesome sight. They found Iris. Uh, she was lying by the sink. Uh, a further search of the house um, located Mandy in, in the lounge. The woman had been shot. Um, Iris had been shot twice. Mandy had been shot four times. Shotgun cartridges were found at the house. Uh, so it, it was clear to the police officers um, that uh, it was a, a, a shotgun killing of both women. Immediately, police get to work preserving the scene. Once the scene's been cordoned off, um, we'll be thinking about fast-track actions. Um, what is it that we can do now um, to, to move the investigation on? The house was set back from the road, so was there any CCTV that, that could be uh, reviewed straight away? Um, what we want to do is try and identify the offenders as soon as possible. We were sitting here watching telly, and... All we could hear was sirens and a lot of commotion. And I went out and I could see the helicopter flying over Auntie's house. And I come in and I said, there's something up to the wife. And at the time we had a phone and I rung up my father and I said, there's something going on up auntie's house. And then my father rung me and said, there's been a murder. And I, I said, well, what do you mean there's been a murder? He said, yeah, they found two women murdered up by the garage. And then the bell began to sink in. And I can remember my father saying to me then, uh, it's got to be them. And uh, that was a shock and a half when we knew it was both, both of them. Quick assessments of the house revealed that there was no one else on the scene. However, it appeared that some items had gone missing. A DVD was taken. Um, the women's handbags were taken. The motive looked like it was burglary. Was this a burglary gone wrong? It was just devastating, absolutely devastating. And you just could never, ever imagine something like that happening in Ockliffe. I think everyone talks to everybody and it would be a very short period of time until everyone knew the situation. I mean, this is, this is a quiet area. People will tell you that. It was quiet then, it's quiet now. Um, to get a, a double shooting, two people dead in the village, um, truly exceptional. And the question on everybody's lips was, who had committed such a heinous murder? In a little, little village or little villages, things spread quite quick. And people were all concerned because things like that don't happen. It's uh, a nightmare. This was a shocking crime for the village of Hockliffe. Somebody using that amount of force on two um, helpless women uh, has only one intention, and that is to kill them. In the quiet Bedfordshire village of Hockliffe, news has spread of the brutal murder of Iris Jones and her foster daughter, Mandy Joseph. This is the house where Iris Jones and her late husband Clifford cared for 120 foster children. But this kindness was to prove her downfall. The local community, and it was a quiet little area, were obviously shocked by the whole incident and very sad at the loss of two well-respected members of the community. Everyone knew about it. Um, it was the talk of the village. Um, uh, as I moved along the high street, 
um, talking to people, um, everyone was aware of what had happened. Lots of people knew uh, Irish Jones, uh, knew Mandy, and um, they were just stunned that uh, two pillars of the community, two kind, caring people, should have had their lives ended in such a way. To me, as silly as it sounds, it's a bit like when Lady Di died, all went quiet, you know? And I think that's how it was. Um, there was so many police, police around and all that lot, but it shocked everyone, really shocked, shocked the villages, not just Ockcliffe. With fear spreading through the community, police need to quickly establish the circumstances around the murders. Once the scene's been called off, the police will look for any fast-track actions, so anything that, that can lead them to the identity of suspects or, or the offenders. Um, and that will include um, any passive data like um, CCTV, AMPR, any phone work that can be done. But it will also include speaking to witnesses, the suspects, but also um, what we call victimology. If you find out how a person lived, you may find out how they died. Post-mortem results reveal that Iris was shot twice and Mandy four times using a shotgun. This is a, a very brutal murder. The way both Iris and Mandy have been gunned down with a shotgun, it's absolutely, yeah, it is. It's, it's top-scale brutal. It was vicious in the extreme. Mandy had been shot in the chest and also in the hand, which... Um, shattered the mobile phone she was holding to make the 999 call. So that's why it abruptly ended. Upon realising what was happening, she ran to the phone, dialed 999 and was screaming for help. But the phone was shot out of her hand and, and this was confirmed by the pathologist uh, during their post-mortem. With the emergency call cutting out when Mandy was shot, police confirm the time of death as 7.45pm so can start to piece together Iris and Mandy's last known movements. The police have been out talking to residents in the area, doing house-to-house -house inquiries. And of course, they'd also made inquiries with the garage forecourt, where uh, there was a shop, and they spoke to the staff there. Mandy had finished her shift at the, the care home in Luton, where she worked, and had arrived home, um, but first she called up the garage forecourt and went into the shop uh, to buy some items, um, fire lighters, um, because I think the plan was to have a, a log fire that evening. Uh, so she brought fire lighters, um, she brought some cigarettes, um, said hello to the staff uh, before going back up to the house. And inquiries at the garage give police their first breakthrough. That garage forecourt was subject to CCTV, which was handed over to the police. The thing with this investigation is we can time the 999 call. So um, one of the fast-track actions would be to review any CCTV in the area around that time. Um, and an obvious one was the garage forecourt, because you had to drive past that or, th or through it to get to Iris's house. When officers reviewed the CCTV, they identified a vehicle uh, that came down the pathway and back out onto the A6 um, around the time of the murder. And one sees this people carrier moving in the distance, moving past the garage uh, along the track. And it was at a time which was about 10 minutes after a 999 call had been made from the house. And that's what led the police to go uh, to find um, and identify who was driving the vehicle and so on. Once we have the registration number of the vehicle, um, it was flagged on the police national computer uh, to be stopped and checked and reported back to Bedfordshire because they may be witnesses to the offence, they also may be the offenders. So it's imperative that we find them as soon as possible because we can put them in the area of the murder at the time it happened. A 
day after the murder and police track down the car in Suffolk. Inside is a couple. But that's not all. When they searched the vehicle, they found a shotgun in the back. Once the police find a shotgun in the rear of the vehicle, um, then they were arrested on suspicion of murder straight away because we've got two victims with shotgun wounds. So you've got your suspicion straight away. The police told us on that Monday they had arrested the couple along with a 14-year-old boy. Police named the couple arrested as 36-year-old Anita Mansfield and her husband, 46-year-old Michael Milcroft, as well as an unnamed teenager. Where a shotgun has been used or a firearm has been used, it's vital that we identify everybody who may have been responsible or may have come into contact with the weapon. So in this case, um, the police forensically examined uh, the 14-year-old boy and that examination revealed he had gunshot residue on him. He is showered um, with gunshot debris. So he was at the scene of the crime. So that's where the police start accusing him being part of the murder. Once suspects are arrested in a case, that's just the start of the work for the police. There's a huge amount of forensic work that has to be done. We have to carry out searches at their home address uh, or home addresses. Um, and we have to speak to witnesses or people that knew them and dig into their background as well to see if there's any motive that we can identify. Police start by looking into the backgrounds of Anita Mansfield and Michael Milcroft to see how they could be linked to Mandy and Iris. Anita Mansfield was someone um, Michael Milcroft met uh, in the 1980s. Uh, he met her in a pub in Dunstable. Uh, they quickly formed a relationship. He then married Anita Mansfield and they had a family together. We do know that he may have worked as a, a, a pop man, um, a helper in a, in a local pub in Leighton Buzzard at one stage, but uh, to all intents and purposes, he was unemployed. He was a carer for an, Anita. She didn't work. She had health issues to the extent that uh, she told people she, she couldn't work. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of her neighbours um, thought this was a bit of a sham and that she was using... Uh, her, her poor health as, as a meal ticket was the way it was described. She was claiming benefits but always had um, delusions of grandeur. She craved a more uh, affluent lifestyle. Information found at the couple's home at the time of the arrest reveals they were on the verge of moving. Millcroft and Mansfield had, had set their hearts on buying a large country house in Suffolk. Um, really, they, they wanted to put their lives on a sound financial footing. They had lived a nomadic life of uh, living a very much a uh, hand-to-mouth existence. They wanted to buy a big house uh, for the family. They'd found a house to move to the dream home, which I think was one of the most expensive properties in the area. Uh, and uh, they wanted to go to that home with its swimming pool and so on. And so the house in near Beckles, that became the house of the, their dreams. And it was, uh, it was on the market, I think, for 740,000 pounds. The purchase should have gone through in the December of 2004. But again, Millcroft and Mansfield weren't ready. They hadn't got the, the funds. And so a new date uh, was arrived at, which was February 28. Millcroft and Mansfield were pulling the wool over the, the seller's eyes um, in relation to um, the funding for buying their house. With the couple living on state benefits and with no savings, Police are perplexed as to how they can afford such an expensive new home. But it's not long before officers discover something of interest. They were renting um, a property and searches of that property 
found um, documents belonging to Mandy Joseph in the house itself. The documents are revealed to be life insurance policies taken out by Mandy Joseph 18 months earlier. She took out two uh, with different companies. One was Norwich Union and one was Zurich Insurance. Further investigations reveal that in the event of Mandy's death, her beneficiary named in the policies would receive a staggering £800,000. And this beneficiary was named as Anita Oakfield Bennett, also known as Anita Mansfield. Suddenly, police believe they have a motive for murder. For the insurance companies to pay out, Mandy Joseph had to die. Police investigating the murders of Mandy Joseph and Iris Jones have arrested a couple. Anita Mansfield and Michael Milcroft, alongside a 14-year-old boy. A search of the couple's home uncovers life insurance documents in the name of Mandy Joseph, which would pay out £800,000 to Anita Mansfield if she died. Their plan was to get their hands on around £800,000 and unknown to Mandy, um, Anita Mansfield had taken out life insurance on her life um, so that in the event of Mandy's death, the money from two life insurance policies would come to Mansfield and Millcroft. You can't just go out and take an insurance policy on somebody. Um, there has to be a lot of deception involved. And in this case, they deceived both Mandy and the insurance company. The couple were extremely cunning all the way through. They built up a picture of Mandy's medical history. They had documents belonging to Mandy they shouldn't have had. Um, they had a mobile phone of Mandy's that uh, was taken from the house. Again, it was, they, these were all things that could provide them with details of Mandy that would help them uh, in the, uh, the plan to set up these bogus insurance policies. Police now believe Anita and Michael fraudulently set up the insurance policies to help fund a new lifestyle. The plan was to buy this large mansion with the proceeds of, of, of that insurance policy. There were policies apparently taken out on the life of Mandy and they would have uh, provided uh, the husband and wife defendants uh, with a beautiful home, with a swimming pool and all sorts of other good qualities. To get the money, Mandy Joseph had to die, and that meant um, they had to kill her. But the question still remains. How are Anita and Michael connected to their victims, Mandy and Iris? Michael Milcroft was the foster son of Iris Jones. He had gone to live with Iris and her family in 1959 when he was just 10 days old. And Iris gave um, a stable home uh, full of love and, and, and warmth to, to lots and lots of children. And Michael Milcroft was one of them. So at the age of 10 days old, he was, he was living with Iris and brought up by Iris and her late husband and, part, and became part of the family. So for his whole life, Iris was his mother. I remember Michael, yeah, he, he'd be a bit younger than me. He used to play with us as kids. He was part of our family. It was said that Michael regarded Mandy as his... his younger sister. Um, she looked at, on him as an older brother. Um, they were brought up together as children. They sat round the dinner table, went on holidays together. At one stage, Michael's girlfriend, Anita, even moved into the home with him. But in 1989, it seems there was a divide in the family. Iris and Mandy, Michael and Anita had all gone on holiday to Mallorca. There was a big row while on holiday, with the result that 
When everyone returned, Michael and Anita Mansfield moved out. And that really marked the 12 year gap in things because uh, he stayed away from Iris and Mandy for all that time and didn't come back into their lives until around 2000. When Michael came back, he changed his name. He was always uh, known as Michael Jones. He'd taken Iris's name. But he was now calling himself Michael Millcroft. And he was married uh, to Anita. They'd started a family. And he was unemployed. It's believed that this is the point in which the couple devised their devious plan. For that to happen by a foster brother is just... Um, you, you wouldn't put that, would you? It's, it's something that is totally unbelievable to think that money corrupts everything. Um, to kill them both, uh, nightmare. Nightmare. You know, we kept thinking to ourselves, no, it can't be Michael what's done it. With news sinking in that Iris's own foster son could be behind her murder, forensic evidence comes in. We have the forensic evidence, uh, DNA on the um, triggers of the shotgun, um, victim's blood um, on the shotgun, as well as Mansfield's DNA. These are the people responsible for the deaths. Police present all their evidence against Anita Mansfield, Michael Millcroft and the teenager to the Crown Prosecution Service. And they uh, decided to charge them with murder. There were murder counts and also counts of attempting to obtain money by deception. With the three pleading not guilty to murder, preparation begins to build a case for trial. Starting with trying to prove that the couple had taken out the fraudulent insurance policy. Anita did much of the setting up over the phone. She would ring an insurance company, pretended to be Mandy Joseph, and proceeded to give Mandy's medical history, um, saying what she smoked in a week, what alcohol intake, a general medical history, that sort of thing. These were all details that she had somehow gleaned over the last few years in the, the build-up uh, to the killings, and uh, it helped her in the pretense that she was Mandy Joseph on the phone. With the policy set up, there was only one thing left to do. Mandy's death was essential for the claim to be made on insurance. It was a racing certainty that Iris would be in the cottage because at that time she was housebound. So they both had to be killed if they were going to succeed in getting the insurance money. It's hard to believe that anybody thought they could get away with it. I mean, to us, you've got to be a little bit sick in the head to think that you can get away away with something like that to start off with. With the trial looming, defence barristers are appointed for the three defendants. I've done many murder trials, either prosecuting or defending. The first I knew about this case was I was instructed in the autumn of 2005, and because the police and the CPS uh, had chosen to charge the boy with being a murderer, uh, he went into custody. So he's remanded in custody, and he goes to a small specialist unit where I visited him. But there was one piece of information which hadn't yet been revealed about the 14-year-old boy. He was their son. And I think potentially the most evil part of the case was that the parents thought they could blame their son and get away with it.
in Bedfordshire, Michael Milcroft, Anita Mansfield and their own son have pleaded not guilty to the murder of Iris Jones and her foster daughter, Mandy Joseph. The trial begins at Luton Crown Court. The defendants in the case were uh, a mother who complained of ill health, a father who was a rather pathetic sort of individual, and their 14-year-old son who left the premises covered in uh, gunpowder. What was revealed in court was the lengths that they went to to plan this murder. The court hears exactly what unfolded on that fateful day. It was just an ordinary day. It was a Sunday afternoon. It was known that uh, Millcroft and Mansfield were coming to the house that evening. Uh, and that's one of the reasons uh, that she called into the shop, because uh, the plan was to have a log fire burning for them when they arrived to make it homely and welcoming. And so Mandy had called into the shop to buy um, fire lighters and uh, to help get the fire going. Iris, he was waiting for him in the kitchen, having made a cup of tea and got a, a log fire roaring. The first shot would have been delivered to the foster mother, she goes down on the ground in the kitchen. Mandy came into the kitchen, having heard the shot, and received the second barrel. Uh, she staggered out of the kitchen, and the son was able to describe to me that uh, his father, having fumbled with the shotgun, reloaded it, went out into the hallway and shot uh, Mandy a second time. At one point, Mandy Joseph had been on her knees, um, having received a shotgun blast, but she was still on her knees when she was shot again. Mandy still wasn't dead, so he fired in bullets, uh, shotgun into her again a couple of times and then returned to the kitchen where his foster mother was still breathing. So she heard the killing and he fired at her, finally killing her, and then left the premises. In those last seconds of their lives, um, for Mandy and Iris, it must have been truly terrifying. In the execution of their crime, the couple went to great lengths to make sure their plan didn't fail. They even planned to alter the shot in the shotgun cartridge. Normally a shotgun cartridge will fire small ball bearings and, and they will spread out into a certain pattern. In this case they used hard, uh, harder and larger ball bearings. Um, absolutely lethal uh, and illegal to, to change the shot as well. The jury also hears how the couple went even further to try to distance themselves from the crime by blaming their son. Here were two defendants saying that it was the third defendant that did it. They were totally innocent. If there was any dishonesty shown by them when they were first seen by the police, it was because they wanted to protect the boy. That was their story. His story, of course, was that he simply wasn't involved. I think potentially the most evil part of the case was that the parents thought they could blame their son and get away with it. I relied upon the 14-year-old boy, he was then 15 when I represented him, relied on his recollection. He was the only witness to the killing and his recollection was clear, and it seemed to fit in with other evidence. The young boy was able to tell the police that he was aware that Millcroft and Mansfield 
had been planning the deaths of the women for some time and that various ways of killing them had been discussed and, and thought about. They sent the 14-year-old son to the library to research on poisoning. He did what he was told. He went and looked in the library and read about one or two things and reported back on it. Researching not just an insurance scam followed by a shooting, but other methods that uh, how Mandy should be killed, um, including looking into poisoning her, looking into electrocuting her, um, looking into uh, masonry, heavy masonry falling onto her, or that she would be the victim of a mugging gone wrong. But it was clear um, from the evidence that was presented that they've manipulated him as he was growing up. Anita's defence um, mirrored that of her husband. Both claimed they heard the firearm discharged and the father left the vehicle and uh, went in and found this dreadful scene. She claimed to have remained in the vehicle uh, outside the cottage. Her, her husband went in and then left a few minutes later together with um, the boy. The thing I remember most about this investigation was the sheer callousness and brutality of the murder and the callousness to um, take out life insurance policies because they wanted a house and the brutality to murder two innocent women so that you can buy that house, it's just, it's evil. After weeks of hearing evidence, the jury retires to consider their verdict. The 14-year-old boy was found not guilty in this case. He wasn't wicked and he wasn't a killer. And that's what the jury must have been satisfied for by, at the end of their deliberations, that he had not been proved to be any part of the murder. Then the jury delivers its verdict against Anita Mansfield and Michael Millcroft. The evidence in this case was overwhelming. We have the forensic evidence. Um, there's Millcroft's fingerprints on the trigger uh, of the shotgun, as well as Mansfield's DNA. The 14-year-old boy had shotgun residue uh, on his person. Um, we've also got the CCTV from the time of the murder um, and we've also got the shotgun found uh, in the back of Millcroft's car. Adding to that, the documentation belonging to Mandy Joseph found at the rented um, property in Suffolk as well as all the financial documents which identified fraudulent life insurance policies. So, yeah, pretty damn. And it appears the jury agreed. Both were found guilty of murder. Anita Mansfield received a sentence of 30 years and Michael Millcroft uh, received a sentence of 25 years. Mansfield got the longer sentence because the judge found that she had been the prime mover in what happened. In putting together the plan, she had been the cold, calculated director of operations. Millcroft had very much been a passenger in what happened. And the reality was that this was a vicious, mean, wicked killing. And I seem to remember an observation by the judge that they had shown no remorse at any time, and that was clearly the case. The judge said this was, um, it was no sudden spur of the moment killing. They never once apologised for, um, for what had happened. Um, they showed no remorse. And the case has left its mark. When you leave the court afterwards, you never forget the tragedy of the death of the two women. I think the saddest thing about this crime is how little um, Millcroft and Mansfield valued the lives of, of, the, of their family. What the, why they done it, I'd, well I know why they done it, they done it for money, but why anyone would think they could get away with it, it's quite unbelievable really. I've been a policeman now for nearly 29 years. 
and I have I've dealt with some very nasty people, but I've never come across any people quite so evil. Following the sentencing of Millcroft and Mansfield, Iris's natural son, Brian, revealed how his mum would have been looking forward to her foster son's visit on that fateful day. First thing she'd do would be at the kitchen sink to make a cup of tea. And uh, that's how she would have greeted them. Hello, love, do you want a cup of tea? And then they shot her. I mean, Mandy would still be here now, and even today. There's not many days you don't... Something triggers your mind and you think of Mandy and our, my auntie Iris. That's all I can really say. The death of, of Iris and Mandy, these were women that had given their lives to... to to helping and caring for other people. Iris especially, she had taken Michael into her arms when he was just 10 days old. Truly, truly shocking and uh, really, really upsetting. 